On Ninsai, a thinner, weekday version of the crowd went through the motions of the dance. I gotta see this guy, Case said, watching his reflection in her glasses. I got biz to cancel out of. Bullshit, she said. You're going in there to check us out with your smuggler. Ah, uh, Case, sport, it does look as though your companion there is definitely armed, aside from having a fair amount of silicon in her head. What is this about, exactly? Dean's ghostly cough seemed to hang in the air between them. Hey, hold on, Julie. Anyway, I'm coming in alone. You can be sure of that, old son. Wouldn't have it any other way. Okay, she said, go. Five minutes any more and I'll come in and I'll cool your tight friend permanently. She turned and walked out, past stacked white modules of preserved ginger. Keeping stranger company than usual, Case? asked Julie. Julie, she's gone. You want to let me in? Please, Julie? The bolts worked. Slowly, Case, said the voice. Turn on the works, Julie, all the stuff in the desk, Case said, taking his place in the swivel chair. It's on all the time, Dean said mildly, taking a gun and aiming it carefully at Case. It was a belly gun, a magnum revolver with the barrel sawn down to a nub. The front of the trigger guard had been cut away and the grips wrapped with what looked like old masking tape. Case thought it looked very strange in Dean's manicured pink hands. Just taking care, you understand, Dean said. Nothing personal. Now tell me what you want. I need a history lesson, Julie, and a go-to on somebody. Go-to on whom, old son? Gaijin name of Armitage, sweet in the Hilton. Dean put the pistol down. Sit still, Case. He tapped something out on a lap terminal. It seems as though you know as much as my net does, Case. This gentleman seems to have a temporary arrangement with the Yakuza, and the sons of the Neon Chrysanthemum have ways of screening their allies from the likes of me. I wouldn't have it any other way. Now, history. What sort of history? The war, Julie. Screaming fist. Oh, famous. Don't they teach you history these days? Great bloody post-war political football, that was. Watergate it all to hell and back. Your brass case, your sprawl side brass, and where was it? McLean? In the bunkers, all of that? Great scandal. Wasted a fair bit of patriotic young flesh case in order to test some new technology. They knew about the Russians' defenses, it came out later. Knew about the imps' magnetic pulse weapons? Sent those fellows in regardless. Just to see. Any of those guys make it out, Julie? Oh, Christ, Dean said. It's been bloody years. Though I do think a few did. One of the teams. Got hold of a Sov helicopter, you know. Flew it back to Finland. Didn't have entry codes, of course. Shot hell out of the Finnish defense forces in the process. Special forces types. Case nodded. The smell of preserved ginger was overwhelming. Thanks, Julie. I owe you one. Later, he'd tell himself that the evening at Sammy's had felt wrong from the start that even as he'd followed Molly along the corridor, shuffling through a trampled mulch of ticket stubs and styrofoam cups, he'd sensed it, Linda's death, waiting. They'd gone to the Namban after he'd paid off his debt to wage with a roll of Armitage's new yen, then he'd taken Molly back to the chat for a drink. Wasting your time, cowboy, Molly said, when Case took an octagon from the pocket of his jacket. How's that? It's your new pancreas, pal. Those plugs in your liver. Armitage had them designed to bypass that shit. She tapped the octagon. You're biochemically incapable of getting off on amphetamine or cocaine. Eat it. Eat a dozen. Nothing will happen. He did. Nothing did. Three beers later, she was asking rats about the fights. Sammy's rats said. I'll pass, Case said. I hear they kill each other down there. An hour later, she was buying tickets. Sammy's was an inflated dome behind a portside warehouse. The air was damp and close with the smell of sweat and concrete. 
No light but the holograms that shifted and flickered above the ring, reproducing the movements of the two men below. Reflected colors flowed across Molly's lenses as the men circled. The holograms were ten power magnifications. At ten, the knives they held were just under a meter long. The knife fighter's grip is the fencer's grip, Case remembered. The fingers curled, thumb aligned with the blade. The knives seemed to move of their own accord, gliding with a ritual lack of urgency through the arcs and passes of their dance, point passing point, as the men waited for an opening. Molly's upturned face was smooth and still, watching. I'll go find us some food, Case said. He didn't like this place. He turned and walked back into the shadows. Too dark, too quiet. He bought yakitori on skewers and two cartons of beer. Glancing up at the holograms, he saw that blood laced one figure's chest. Thick brown sauce trickled down the skewers and over his knuckles. Blood sprayed from a jugular in a red gout of light, and now the crowd was screaming, rising, screaming as one figure crumpled, the hologram fading, flickering, raw edge of vomit in his throat. He closed his eyes, took a deep breath, opened them, and saw Linda Lee step past him, her gray eyes blind with fear. She wore the same French fatigues and gone into shadow. Pure, mindless reflex, he threw the beer and chicken down and ran after her. He might have called her name, but he'd never be sure. After image of a single hair, fine line of red light. Her white sneakers flashing. Again, the ghost of the laser branded across his eye, bobbing in his vision as he ran. Someone tripped him. Concrete tore his palms. He rolled and kicked, failing to connect. A thin boy's spiked blonde hair was leaning over him. The boy smiled and drew something from his sleeve, a razor. Case saw the razor dipping for his throat. The face was erased in a humming cloud of microscopic explosions. Molly's flechettes at 20 rounds per second. The boy coughed once convulsively and toppled across Case's legs. He was walking toward the stalls into the shadows. He found her. She was thrown down at the foot of a concrete pillar. One white sneaker had come off somehow and lay beside her head. Case walked on, feeling nothing. A hey, Case, Molly's mirrors emerged from the deeper shadow. You okay? Something mewled and bubbled in the dark behind her. Fight's over, Case. Time we go home. He tried to walk past her, back into the dark, where something was dying. She stopped him. Friends of your tight friend killed your girl for you. We got a partial profile on that old bastard when we did you, man. He'd fry anybody for a few new ones. The one back there said they got onto her when she was trying to fence your ram. Just cheaper for them to kill her and take it. I got the one who had the laser to tell me about it. Coincidence we were here, but I had to make sure. Case felt as though his brain were jammed. Who, he said. Who sent them? She passed him a bag of preserved ginger. He saw that her hands were sticky with blood. Back in the shadows, someone made wet sounds and died. After the post-operative check at the clinic, Molly took him to the port. Armitage was waiting. He chartered a hovercraft. Part 2. The Shopping Expedition Home Home was Bama, the sprawl, the Boston-Atlanta metropolitan axis. Opening his eyes, he saw Molly naked and just out of reach across an expanse of very new pink temper foam. Her body was spare, neat, the muscles like a dancer's. He set up. The room was empty, aside from two nylon bags, new and identical. He swung his feet to the floor. His head ached. He remembered Paris, shopping. She had taken him shopping. He knelt beside the bags. The first one he opened was stuffed with things he didn't remember buying. Beneath a green t-shirt, he discovered a bright nine-pointed star. Souvenir, Molly said. I noticed you were always looking at him. Someone's coming later to secure the place, Armitage said. He stood in the open doorway. You ever the heat, Mr. Armitage? Case asked. 
Armitage was no taller than Case, but with his broad shoulders and military posture, he seemed to fill the doorway. The handsome, inexpressive features offered the routine beauty of the cosmetic boutiques, a conservative amalgam of the past decade's leading media faces. The pale glitter of his eyes heightened the effect of a mask. Lots of special forces types wound up cops, I mean, Case said, or corporate security. That number you had them do on my pancreas, that's like a cop routine. You're a lucky boy, Case. You should thank me. Should I? You needed a new pancreas. The one we bought for you frees you from a dangerous dependency. Well, thanks, but I was enjoying that dependency. Good, because now you have a new one. How's that? You have 15 toxin sacs bonded to the lining of various main arteries, Case. They're dissolving, very slowly. Each one contains a mycotoxin. You're already familiar with the effect of that mycotoxin. It was the one your former employers gave you in Memphis. Case blinked up at the smiling mask. You have time to do what I'm hiring you for, Case, but that's all. Do the job and I can inject you with an enzyme that will dissolve the bond without opening the sacs. Then you'll need a blood change. So you see, Case, you need us. You need us as badly as you did when we scraped you up from the gutter. Summer in the sprawl and the mall crowd swaying like wind-blown grass, a field of flesh shot through with sudden eddies of need and gratification. He sat beside Molly and filtered sunlight on the rim of a dry concrete fountain. Nothing here like the electric dance of Ninsai. This was different commerce, different rhythm, in the smell of fast food and perfume and fresh summer sweat. Where'd he go? Case had asked Molly. He likes hotels, she said, big ones, near airports if he can manage it. Let's go down to the street. So what's he got on you, he said. How's he got the working girl kinked? Professional pride, baby, that's all. We're going to get it some breakfast, okay? Eggs, real bacon. Come on, we'll tube it to Manhattan and get us a real breakfast. Lifeless neon spelled out Metro Holographics in dusty capitals. Case picked at a shred of bacon lodged between his front teeth. He'd given up asking Molly where they were going and why. Jabs in the ribs and the sign for silence were all he'd gotten in reply. Something was moving in the shadows behind Metro Holographics. The door was a sheet of corrugated roofing. In front of it, Molly's hands flowed through an intricate sequence of jive that he couldn't follow. He caught the sign for cash, the thumb brushing the tip of the forefinger. The door swung inward and she led him into the smell of dust. They stood in a clearing, dense tangles of junk rising on either side to walls lined with shelves of crumbling paperbacks. He followed her back through a narrow canyon of impacted scrap. The tunnel ended with an ancient army blanket tacked across a doorway. White light flooded out as Molly ducked past it. Four square walls of blank white plastic, floored with white hospital tile. In the center stood a square white wooden table and four white folding chairs. The man who stood in the doorway behind them seemed to have been designed in a wind tunnel. His ears were very small, plastered flat against his narrow skull, and his large front teeth were canted sharply backward. He held a handgun in his left hand. He gestured to Case, pointed at a white slab of plastic that leaned near the doorway. Case crossed to it and saw that it was a solid sandwich of circuitry, nearly a centimeter thick. He helped the man lift it and position it securely in the doorway time, the man said, counting. You know the rate, Molly. We need a scan, Finn, for implants. So get over there. Stand on the tape. Straighten up. Yeah, now turn, turn. Give me a full 360. Case watched her rotate between two fragile-looking stands studded with sensors. The man took a small monitor from his pocket. Something new in your head. Yeah, silicon. It's a clock, right? Your glasses give me the read they always do. Same with your claws. Get over here, Case. He saw a scuffed X in black on the white floor. Turn around to your slow. 
Nah, this guy's a virgin. Some cheap dental work is all. You want me to shut the screen down? Just for as long as it takes you to leave, Finn. Then we'll want full screen for as long as we want it. Hey, that's fine by the Finn, Ma. You're only paying by the second. They sealed the door behind him and Molly turned one of the white chairs around and sat on it. We talk now. This is about as private as I can afford. What about? What we're doing, working for Armitage. And you're saying this isn't for his benefit? Yeah. I saw your profile, Case, and I've seen the rest of our shopping list once. You ever work with the dead? No, he said. I could, I guess. I'm good at what I do. You know the Dixie Flatline's dead? Case nodded. His heart, I heard. You'll be working with his construct, she smiled. Taught you the ropes, huh? Somebody got a recording of McCoy Polly? Who? I can't see it. You'd never have sat still for it. Since net paid him mega, you bet your ass. Well, if we can get the flat line, Case said, we're home free. He was the best. You know he did brain death three times? She nodded. Look, Case, I've been trying to suss out who it is is backing Armitage since I signed on. Armitage gets orders. Like somebody tells him to go off to Chiba, pick up a pill head who's making one last wobble through the burnout belt, and trade a program for the operation that'll fix him up. We could have bought 20 world-class cowboys for what the market was ready to pay for that surgical program. You were good, man, but you were never that good. Obviously makes sense to somebody, he said. Somebody big. Hey, don't let me hurt your feelings, she grinned. We're going to be pulling one hardcore run just to get the Flatline's construct. Cincinnati has it locked in a library vault uptown, tighter than an eel's ass case. Weird. Yeah, it's all weird, he said. You're weird. This hole's weird. Who's the weird little gopher outside in the hall? Finn's an old connection of mine, she said. Fence, mostly. Software. This privacy biz is a sideline. But I got Armitage to let him be our tech here. So when he shows up later, you never saw him. Got it? He stared at her. So tell me what you know about Armitage. Well, for starters, she said, nobody named Armitage took part in any screaming fist. I checked. But you are a cowboy, aren't you? I mean, maybe you could have a little look around. He'd kill me, Case said. Maybe, she said. Maybe not. I think he needs you, Case, real bad. What else is on that list you mentioned? Toys, mostly for you. And one certified psychopath name of Peter Riviera. Real ugly customer. Where's he, Case asked. I don't know, but he's one sick fuck. I saw his profile. God awful. So we're together in this, you and me, partners? Case looked at her. I got a lot of choice, huh? She laughed. You got it, cowboy. The Matrix has its roots in primitive arcade games, said the voiceover, in early graphics programs, holograms, and military experimentation with cranial jacks. On the Sony, a two-dimensional space war faded behind a forest of mathematically generated ferns, demonstrating the spatial possibilities of logarithmic spirals. Cold blue military footage burned through, Lab animals wired into test systems, helmets feeding into fire-controlled circuits of tanks and warplanes. Cyberspace, a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation, by children being taught mathematical concepts, a graphic representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system, unthinkable complexity, lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, Clusters and constellations of data, like city lights, receding. Hey, what's that? Molly asked as he flipped the channel selector. Kid show, Case said. Off, he said to the Hosaka. You want to try now, Case? She said. Wednesday, eight days from waking in cheap hotel with Molly beside him. You want me to go out, Case? Make it easier for you alone? No, he said. Stay. Doesn't matter. He settled the black terry sweatband across his forehead, careful not to disturb the flat Sendai dermatrodes. He closed his eyes, 
found the ridged face of the power stud, and in the blood-lit dark behind his eyes, silver phosphines boiling in from the edge of space, symbols, figures, faces, please, he prayed, now, a gray disc, the color of Chiba sky, now, disc beginning to rotate faster, becoming a sphere of paler gray, expanding and flowed, flowered for him, fluid neon origami trick, the unfolding of his distanceless home, his country, transparent 3D chessboard extending to infinity, inner eye opening to the stepped scarlet pyramid of the eastern seaboard vision authority, burning beyond the green cubes of Mitsubishi Bank of America, and high and very far away he saw the spiral arms of military systems forever beyond his reach. And somewhere he was laughing in a white-painted loft, distant fingers caressing his deck, tears of release streaking his face. Molly was gone when he took the trodes off, and the loft was dark. He'd been in cyberspace for five hours. The security package taped to the steel fire door bleeped twice. Entry requested, it said. Subject is cleared per my program. Case set up as the door opened, expecting to see Molly or Armitage. Christ, said a voice. I know that bitch can see in the dark. A squat figure stepped in. Turn the lights on, okay? Case scrambled off the slab and found the old-fashioned switch. I'm the Finn, said the Finn, and made a warning face at Case. I'm Case. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. I'm doing some hardware for your boss, it looks like. The Finn crossed to the work table and glanced at the Ono Sendai. Hey, look stock. Soon fix that. But here's your problem, kid. He took a filthy manila envelope from inside his jacket and extracted a black rectangle from the envelope. What is it? Case asked. It's a flip-flop switch, basically, the Finn said. Wire it into your Sendai here. You can access a live or recorded sim stem without having to jack out of the Matrix. What for? Case asked. I haven't got a clue, the Finn said. No, I'm fitting Maul for a broadcast rig, though, so it's probably her sensorium you'll access. So now you get to find out just how tight those jeans really are, huh? Case sat in the loft with the dermatrode strapped across his forehead. A countdown was in progress in one corner of the monitor screen. Cowboys didn't get into Sim Stim, he thought, because it was basically a meat toy. He knew that the trodes he used and the little plastic tiara dangling from a SimStim deck were basically the same, and that the cyberspace matrix was actually a drastic simplification of the human sensorium, but SimStim itself struck him as a gratuitous multiplication of flesh output. The new switch was patched into his Sendai with a thin ribbon of fiber optics, and one and two, and cyberspace slid into existence from the cardinal points. Then he keyed the new switch. The abrupt jolt into other flesh. Matrix gone, a wave of sound and color. She was moving through a crowded street past stalls vending discount software. For a few frightened seconds, he fought helplessly to control her body. Then he willed himself into passivity, became the passenger behind her eyes. Her glasses didn't seem to cut down the sunlight at all. Blue alphanumerics winked the time, low in her left peripheral field. Showing off, he thought. Her body language was disorienting, her style foreign. She seemed continually on the verge of colliding with someone, but people melted out of her way, stepped sideways, made room. She slid a hand into her jacket, a fingertip circling a nipple under warm silk. The sensation made him catch his breath. She laughed. How you doing, Case? He heard the words and felt her form them, but the link was one way. He had no way to reply. The transition to cyberspace when he hit the switch was instantaneous. He punched himself down a wall of primitive ice belonging to the New York Public Library, keying back into her sensorium, into the sinuous flow of muscle, senses sharp and bright. Her destination was one of the dubious software rental complexes that lined memory lane. The clientele were young, few of them out of their teens, they all seemed to have carbon sockets planted behind the left ear, but she didn't focus on them. The counters that fronted the booths displayed hundreds of slivers of Microsoft, 
angular fragments of colored silicon mounted under oblong transparent bubbles. Molly went to the seventh booth along the south wall. Behind the counter, a boy with a shaven head stared vacantly into space, a dozen spikes of Microsoft protruding from the socket behind his ear. Hey, Larry, she said. I have some work for some of your friends. Larry took a glossy black chip and inserted it smoothly into his head. You got a rider, Molly. This says. Somebody else is using your eyes. My partner, she said. Tell your partner to go. Got something for the Panther Moderns, Larry. What are you talking about, lady? Hey, Case, you take off, she said, and he hit the switch, instantly back in the Matrix. Panther Moderns, he said to the Hosaka. Five-minute precy. Ready, the computer said. It wasn't a name he knew. Something new, something that had come in since he'd been in Chiba. Fad swept the youth of the sprawl at the speed of light. Entire subcultures could rise overnight, thrive for a dozen weeks, and then vanish utterly. Go, he said. The Hosaka had accessed its array of libraries, journals, and news services. The precy began with a long hold on a color still that Case at first assumed was a collage of some kind. A boy's face snipped from another image, glued to a photograph of a paint-scrawled wall. Dark eyes, epicanthic folds, obviously the result of surgery, an angry dusting of acne across pale, narrow cheeks. The Hosaka released the freeze. The boy moved, flowing with the sinister grace of a mime pretending to be a jungle predator. His body was nearly invisible, an abstract pattern approximating the scribbled brickwork sliding smoothly across his tight one-piece. Mimetic polycarbon. Cut to Dr. Virginia Rambali, Sociology, NYU. Given their penchant for these random acts of surreal violence, someone said, it may be difficult for our viewers to understand why you continue to insist that this phenomena isn't a form of terrorism. Dr. Rambali smiled. There is always a point at which the terrorists cease to manipulate the media gestalt a point at which the violence may well escalate, but beyond which the terrorist has become symptomatic of the media gestalt itself. Terrorism, as we ordinarily understand it, is innately media-related. The Panther moderns differ from other terrorists precisely in their degree of self-consciousness, in their awareness of the extent to which media divorced the act of terrorism from the original socio-political intent. Skip it, Case said. Case met his first modern two days after. The moderns were mercenaries, practical jokers, nihilistic techno-fetishists. The one who showed up at the loft door with a box of diskettes from the Finn was a soft-voiced boy. His face was a simple graft grown on collagen and shark cartilage polysaccharides, smooth and hideous. You can't let the little prick's generation gap you, Molly said. Case nodded absorbed in the patterns of the sense net ice. This was it. This was what he was, who he was, his being. He forgot to eat. Molly left cartons of rice and foam trays of sushi on the corner of the long table. Sometimes he resented having to leave the deck to use the chemical toilet they had set up in a corner of the loft. Ice patterns formed and reformed on the screen as he mapped the route he'd take through sense net's ice. It was good ice, wonderful ice. He was cutting it. He was working. He lost track of days. And sometimes, falling asleep, particularly when Molly was off on one of her reconnaissance trips with her rented cadre of moderns, images of Chiba came flooding back. Faces and inside neon. Once he woke from a confused dream of Linda Lee, unable to recall who she was or what she'd ever meant to him. When he did remember... He jacked in and worked for nine straight hours. The cutting of Sensnet's ice took a total of nine days. I said a week, Armitage said, unable to conceal his satisfaction when Case showed him his plan for the run. You took your own good time. Balls, Case said, smiling at the screen. That's good work, Armitage. Yes, Armitage admitted. 
but don't let it go to your head. Compared to what you'll eventually be up against, this is an arcade toy. Love you, cat mother, whispered the panther modern's link man. His voice was modulated static in case his head set. Atlanta brood, looks go, go, got it. Molly's voice was clearer. Case settled the trodes in place. He had only a vague idea of what the Panther Moderns planned as a diversion for the SenseNet security people. His job was to make sure the intrusion program he had written would link with the SenseNet systems when Molly needed it to. He watched the countdown in the corner of the screen. Two, one, he jacked in. Mainline, breathed the link man. His case plunged through the glowing strata of SenseNet ice. Good. Check Molly. He hit the sim stem and flipped into her sensorium. She stood before a wall of mirror in the building's vast white lobby. Aside from the huge sunglasses concealing her mirrored inset, she managed to look remarkably like another tourist. She wore a pink plastic raincoat, a white mesh top, loose white pants. She grinned vacantly and popped her gum. Case felt like laughing. He could feel the micro-pore tape across her rib cage, feel the flat little units under it, the radio, the sim stim unit, and the scrambler. He flipped back. His program had reached the fifth gate. The gate blurred past. He laughed. The SenseNet ICE had accepted his entry as a routine transfer from the consortium's Los Angeles complex. He was inside. He flipped again. Molly was strolling past the enormous circular reception desk at the rear of the lobby. 120120 as the readout flared in her optic nerve. At midnight, nine moderns scattered along 200 miles of the sprawl had simultaneously dialed max emergency from payphones. Each modern delivered a short set speech hung up and drifted out into the night. Nine different police departments were absorbing the information that an obscure subsect of militant fundamentalists had just introduced clinical levels of an outlawed psychoactive agent known as Blue Nine into the ventilation system of the SenseNet pyramid. Blue Nine had been shown to produce homicidal psychosis in 85% of experimental subjects. Case hit the switch as his program surged through the gates of the subsystem that controlled security for the SenseNet research library. He found himself stepping into an elevator. Excuse me, but are you an employee? The guard raised his eyebrows. Molly popped her gum. No, she said, driving the first two knuckles of her right hand into the man's solar plexus. As he doubled over, she slammed his head sideways against the wall of the elevator. She touched closed door and stop on the illuminated panel. She took a black box from her coat pocket and inserted a lead in the keyhole that secured the panel's circuitry. The Panther Moderns allowed four minutes for their first move to take effect then injected a second carefully prepared dose of misinformation. This time they shot it directly into the SenseNet building's internal video system. At 12.04.03, every screen in the building strobed for 18 seconds in a frequency that produced seizures in a susceptible segment of SenseNet employees. Then something only vaguely like a human face filled the screens, its features stretched across asymmetrical expanses of bone like some obscene Mercator projection. Blue lips parted wetly as the twisted, elongated jaw moved. Something, perhaps a hand, a thing like a reddish clump of gnarled roots, fumbled toward the camera, blurred and vanished. Subliminally rapid images of contamination, graphics of the building's water supply system, Gloved hands manipulating laboratory glassware, something tumbling down into darkness, a pale splash. The audio track, its pitch adjusted to run at just less than twice the standard playback speed, was part of a month-old newscast detailing potential military uses of a substance known as HSG, a biochemical governing the human skeletal growth factor. Overdoses of HSG threw certain bone cells into overdrive accelerating growth by factors as high as 1,000 percent. At 12.0500, the SenseNet consortium held just over 3,000 employees. At five minutes after midnight, half a dozen NYPD tactical hovercraft were converging on the SenseNet pyramid. They were running full riot lights. A Bama rapid deployment helicopter was lifting off from its pad. Case triggered his second program, a carefully engineered virus. Boston. Molly's voice came from the downlink. I'm downstairs. 
Case switched and saw the blank wall of the elevator. She was unzipping the white pants. A bulky packet, exactly the shade of her pale ankle, was secured there with micropore. She knelt and peeled the tape away. She unfolded the modern suit. She removed the pink raincoat and began to pull the suit on. 12.06.26. Case's virus had bored a window through the library's command ice. He punched himself through and found an infinite blue space ranged with color-coded spheres strung on a tight grid of pale blue neon. In the non-space of the matrix, the interior of a given data construct possessed unlimited subjective dimension. A child's toy calculator accessed through Case's Sendai would have presented limitless gulfs of nothingness hung with a few basic commands. Case began gliding through the spheres as if he were on invisible tracks. Here, this one. Punching his way into the sphere, chill blue neon vault above him starless and smooth as frosted glass, he triggered a sub-program that affected certain alterations in the core custodial commands. Out now, reversing smoothly the virus re-knitting the fabric of the window. Done. In the SenseNet lobby, two panther moderns sat alertly behind a low rectangular planter, taping the riot with video camera. They both wore chameleon suits. Tacticals are spraying foam barricades now, one noted, speaking for the benefit of his throat mic. Rapids are still trying to land their copter. Case hit the SimStim switch and flipped into the agony of broken bone. Molly was braced against the blank gray wall of a long corridor. Case was back in the matrix instantly, a white-hot line of pain fading in his left thigh. What's happening, brood? he asked the link man. I don't know, Cutter. Mother's not talking. Wait. He didn't have time to wait. Taking a deep breath, he flipped again. Molly took a single step trying to support her weight on the corridor wall. In the loft, Case groaned. The second step took her over an outstretched arm. Uniform sleeve bright with fresh blood. Glimpse of a shattered fiberglass shock stave. Her vision seemed to have narrowed to a tunnel. With the third step, Case screamed and found himself back in the matrix. Brood, Boston baby, little problem with the natives. Think one of them broke my leg. What you need now, cat mother? Case forced himself to flip back. She was leaning against the wall. She fumbled through the contents of the suit's pocket and withdrew a sheet of plastic studded with derma discs. She selected three and thumbed them hard against her left wrist over the veins. 6,000 micrograms of endorphin analog came down on the pain like a hammer. She sighed and slowly relaxed. Okay, Brood, okay now, but I'll need a medical team when I come out. Tell my people. Cut her, I'm two minutes from target. Can you hold? Tell her I'm in and holding, Case said. Molly began to limp down the corridor. When she glanced back once, Case saw the crumpled bodies of three SenseNet security guards. One of them seemed to have no eyes. Tacticals and rapids have sealed the ground floor, Cat Mother. Foam barricades. Lobby's getting juicy. A pulsing red cursor crept through the outline of a doorway. Only millimeters from the green dot that indicated the location of the Dixie Flatline's construct. Case tightened the nylon harness that held him in the chair and replaced the trodes. Routine now. Trodes, jack, and flip. The SenseNet Research Library was a dead storage area. Molly hobbled between rows of identical gray lockers. Tell her five more and ten to the left, brood, Case said. She took the left. A white-faced librarian cowered between two lockers. Molly ignored her. That's it, Case said, but she'd already stopped in front of the cabinet that held the construct. Do it, Cutter, Molly said. Case flipped to cyberspace and sent a command pulsing down the crimson thread that pierced the library ice. Five separate alarm systems were convinced that they were still operative. The three elaborate locks deactivated but considered themselves to have remained locked. The library's central bank suffered a minute shift in its permanent memory. The construct had been removed per executive order a month before. Checking for the authorization to remove the construct, the librarian would find the records erased. The door swung open on silent hinges. 0467839, Case said, and Molly drew a black storage unit from the rack. It might take SenseNet days to discover the theft of the construct. The elevator, with Molly's black box taped beside the control panel, remained where she'd left it. 
The guard still lay curled on the floor. Case noticed the derm on his neck, something of Molly's to keep him under. She stepped over him and removed the black box before punching Lobby. As the elevator door hissed open, a woman hurtled backwards out of the crowd into the elevator and struck the rear wall with her head. Molly ignored her. The construct in the suit's pocket dug into Molly's sternum when she moved. She stepped out. Case had seen panic before, but never in an enclosed area. The CenseNet employees spilling out of the elevators had surged for the street doors, only to meet the foam barricades of the tacticals and the sandbag guns of the Bama Rapids. The two agencies, convinced that they were containing a horde of potential killers, were cooperating with an uncharacteristic degree of efficiency. Beyond the shattered wreckage of the main street doors, bodies were piled three deep on the barricades. The hollow thumping of the riot guns provided a constant background for the sound the crowd made as it surged back and forth across the lobby's marble floor. Case had never heard anything like that sound. Neither, apparently, had Molly. Jesus, she said, and hesitated. It was a sort of keening, rising into a bubbling wail of raw and total fear. The lobby floor was covered with bodies, clothing, blood, and long trampled scrolls of yellow printout. Come on, sister, whiff her out. The eyes of two moderns stared at her. You hurt? Come on, Tommy will walk you. Tommy handed something to the one who spoke, a video camera wrapped in polycarbon. Chicago, Molly said, I'm on my way. And then she was falling, not to the marble floor, slick with blood and vomit, but down some blood-warm well into silence and the dark. The Panther modern leader who introduced himself as Lupus Yonder Boy wore a polycarbon suit with a recording feature that allowed him to replay backgrounds at will. Perched on the edge of Case's work table like some kind of -of state-of-the-art gargoyle, he regarded Case and Armitage with hooded eyes. He smiled. His hair was pink. A rainbow forest of Microsofts bristled behind his left ear. The ear was pointed, tufted with more pink hair. His pupils had been modified to catch the light like a cat's. You let it get out of control, Armitage said. He stood in the center of the loft like a statue, wrapped in the dark, glossy folds of an expensive-looking trench coat. Chaos, Mr. Who, Lupus Yonderboy said. That is our mode and modus. That is our central kick. Your woman knows we deal with her, not with you, Mr. Who. She needed her medical team. She's with them. We'll watch out for her. Everything's fine. He smiled again. Pay him, Case said. Armitage glared at him. We don't have the goods. Your woman has it, Yonder Boy said. Pay him. Armitage crossed stiffly to the table and took three fat bundles of new yen from the pockets of his trench coat. You want to count it, he asked Yonder Boy. No, the panther modern said. You'll pay. You're a Mr. Who. You pay to stay one, not a Mr. Name. I hope that isn't a threat, Armitage said. That's business, said Yonder Boy, stuffing the money into the single pocket of the front of his suit. The phone rang. Case answered. Molly, he told Armitage, handing him the phone. The sprawl's geodesics were lightening into pre-dawn gray as Case left the building. His limbs felt cold and disconnected. He couldn't sleep. Lupus was gone, then Armitage, and Molly was in surgery somewhere. He took corners at random, hunched in a new leather jacket. He tried to imagine Armitage's toxin sacs dissolving in his bloodstream, microscopic membranes wearing thinner as he walked. Case. He darted sideways, instinctively getting a wall behind his back. Message for you, Case, said Lupus Yonder Boy. Pardon, not to startle you. You ought to be more careful, Yonder Boy. This is the message. W-I-N-T-E-R-M-U-T-E. From you? No, for you. Who from? Wintermute, Yonder Boy said. Then he was gone. This book is continued on the next cassette.